Hello, everybody. Good evening. Let's take our hymn books, stand together. Page number 40. We'll let everybody come in for a minute, yell at everybody outside to come in. Page number 40. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? We'll sing all four verses as we get started with this beautiful Sunday evening. I'm trying to dry off from all the rain. Page number 40, we'll stand together. Page number 40. saving faith of God, but that's, if that's, and thank God if you got that, praise God for that, but if all you got is saving faith, you're missing out on so much more, and we need more than just a saving faith, I'm glad to be back in church tonight, let's go ahead and go Lord in prayer, ask His blessing, <coughs> excuse me, upon the service tonight, may I have a Rick Montagna, if you would, at least the throne of grace, we'll get started tonight.
Thank you for singing so well. I love that. Soon we'll reach the shining river, and soon our pilgrimage will cease. Soon our happy hearts will quiver with the melody of peace. I know that, that song I think about heaven sound, heaven sounding sweeter all the time. And I know I'm not old yet, but the older I get, the sweeter heaven sounds. I'm, I'm looking forward to what God has for me here on this earth still. But it's going to be so much better when we cross over and gather on that river. Thank God for that song. Now, you won't find uh, that kind of good doctrinal stuff in the 7-Eleven music that's played today. Uh, the modern day kind of stuff. And I'm thankful for these hymns. I love our hymn books. So Pastor Craig told me that earlier we having lunch. And he said, so many churches he's been to recently, a lot of them are getting rid of their hymns and doing things like that. And they do what they want to do. He wasn't being ju judgmental. He's just saying, here's where we're at in the state of our nation. But thank God for churches that still keep the hymn books. Uh, they're so good about them now because it'll help you to learn those little squiggly things above the words. Those are the notes that help us learn how to sing them and try and find harmony and all that stuff. And learn that as you go. And listen, if you don't know what part to get on, just jump in there somewhere and just sing for the glory of God. I'm so thankful uh, for them. I'm glad for the hymn books that we have. Anybody need a bulletin? I've got a quite a few announcements we need to get uh, through tonight. Sister Jenny needs one. Praise the Lord for that. All right, good. So, uh, choir practice again every night. Even though uh, we have our we got a special this next Sunday, quite a few songs we're singing. We still have choir practice every Sunday night at 5:15. So yes, we will have choir practice next Sunday at 5:15. Next Sunday will be a busy day. It's going to be a busy week. Uh, today's a busy day because this is the start of the week. It's not the end of the week, okay? Because Sunday's the Lord's Day. We give Him the first of everything. So Sunday's the Lord's Day. Keep that in mind too. When football season site uh, starts. Sunday night is not football night. Sunday night is the Lord's night. It's still the Lord's day. Uh, so we'll start to thank God for today. But tomorrow, uh, everybody gets to say amen. Tomorrow the kids get to go to camp. So praise the Lord. I know the parents are excited. Well, the kids are excited. The parents are excited. Er, the kids get to go to camp. Tomorrow at 11 o'clock is when the bus is wanting to leave. So be here at 11 uh, with a sack lunch and all of your clothes and your registration forms and, yes, the money and all that stuff. So... Uh, please, unless the kids want to fast all week long, because it does cost the camp money to provide food for them, and that's why there's a registration fee involved. So uh, bring all the money that you have, bring money for the snack shop, all that stuff, a sleeping bag, you've got the list of what to bring. So tomorrow at 11 o'clock with a sack lunch, please don't show up with no sack lunch and then start whining about how hungry you are. Uh, because I, I, I know, I know Brother Craig, he'll look at you and say, too bad, uh, because you're supposed to have a sack lunch. And so I'm not able to go tomorrow, so please bring your sack lunch or just wait until supper at 5.30. Of course, next Sunday or Saturday, we need soul winning and bus calling, so come help us with that. I know, listen, the kids will be coming back that day, but they won't be back until early afternoon. So we go soul winning in the morning. In fact, we can just go soul winning until the kids show up. Until the cows come home, right? Uh, and so we'll uh, soul winning in the morning, soul winning bus calling, and then uh, Brian will go get the kids. They'll be heading out there Friday night. They'll be coming back Saturday. They'll call and let you know uh, when the kids are on the way. So uh, keep that in mind. Pray for them for safety. Pray for them that God would speak to their hearts. And the next Sunday morning, or next Sunday, I'm looking forward to that Independence Day on Sunday this year. Again, I know it's July 4th. Uh, somebody would ask this Do they have a July 4th in England? Actually, well, they they do have July 4th in England, but they don't celebrate Independence Day. I said, that's a trick question. They do have a July 4th in England. Does it just go July 3, July 5? No, they have a July 4th in England. Oh, uh, light bulbs are going off now. Oh, I get it. Yeah, they do have a July 4th, but they don't celebrate July 4th. They have another day I'm sure they celebrate. Just like in Mexico, Cinco de Mayo is not makes an Independence Day. The day they beat the French. That's the day they beat the French. I guess. I don't know. I good. Uh, September 16th is, is Mexican Independence Day. And so Mexico doesn't celebrate, but they have a July 4th. Yeah. Anyway, uh, on July 4th, it's not just happy July 4th, not, and it is happy birthday to America, but make everybody remember this. Help everybody remember this. It's Independence Day. It's Independence Day. 
And so keep that in mind. Happy Independence Day. We celebrate being Americans, being freeborn Americans. We're thankful for our nation and the history and, 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 and hopefully uh, we'll change the direction she's going and keep her great for many, many years to come. So that all that all will say this. We, we bleed red, white, and blue at Tonight Baptist Church. So next Sunday on Independence Day, wear red, white, and blue uh, to church next Sunday. We'll have I'll have some kind of a gift to give to the most patriotic person that day, the most patriotic outfit for the day. So... Um, and you can't be too wild. It's, I'm, I'm not talking about getting crazy, but I'm just saying, red, white, and blue, next Sunday, enjoy the day, Independence Day. And, I, and of course, we preach you on Jesus next Sunday. We'll preach the Bible, that's for sure. But we can enjoy the freedoms we have here because if this nation keeps going the way she's going, it won't be long. We won't be able to preach the way we preach uh, without threat of arrest. Well, thank you for Independence Day. So next Sunday. Then, of course, Sunday night we're having the hamburgers, hot dogs, and stuff after the service. We've already got a few people signed up. But please sign up on there or I'm just going to be calling and telling you what you signed up for. So please make sure you <laughs> sign up to bring something. Also, let me know how many are coming. I, the church is going to buy the hamburgers and hot dogs. And I want to know how many we need to buy. Um, or we'll just have to run and get pizza or something. I don't know, but we want to be able to do that. So let us know how many are coming. Then on the July 8th, we begin our men's fasting. We'll meet together on the 9th to uh, pray and break our fast together. And then on Sunday, uh, July the 11th, uh, Brother Alvino Hernandez will be here preaching the morning service. Then on the 21st, 22nd, 23rd, that's a Wednesday night. Thursday and Friday is a youth conference, the Our Time Youth Conference hosted by uh, the... Uh, New Heights Baptist Church in Albuquerque to be in prayer for that. And then also the youth conference in Oklahoma the beginning of the first week there in August. Looking forward to that. And then as we're praying for and looking toward this, we want to make sure that we're looking for at least 100 by the end of September. At least 100 attendants by the end of September. And so I encourage people that haven't been here for a while. Let's get people uh, in church. And then uh, we'll be. That, what's going to help with that as we are going to kick off, I'll get the date set real, real soon on our Cowboys versus the Cowboys once again. And uh, we want to, and again, we, we want the American Cowboys to win once again. Because we don't want the Dallas Cowboys to win. We want the American Cowboys to win. Because America. We don't want the Dallas Cowboys to win because Dallas Cowboys. Need I say more? So anyway, looking forward to that, and that'll be helpful. Because we want we want to get to 100 by the end of September, and then after September, that's the Sunday morning. It doesn't matter when we hit it, but after September, from October through the end of the year, our goal is to average 100 on Sunday mornings. Good, good, good place to say Amen again. Our goal is to average at least 100. Well, what if we don't? Well, what if we do? I guarantee you, if we haven't set a goal like that before, and guess what? We've never averaged 100. Maybe that's why we've never made it. So here we go. We're, we're doing this. I'm going to preach on this a little bit tonight. We're stepping out by faith. Now, faith without works is dead, being alone, so let's make it happen. So you did so well. You did so well on the uh, north versus the south. We blew out. We blew that number. We had 45 set. I thought there's no way we could make it. And you did so, you worked so hard that we had more than 45 visits in that month. 51. So praise the Lord for that. We can do the same thing. We'll be over 100 by the end of September. I'm looking forward to that. So let's pray and work that way. Good group here on Sunday night as well. Did we miss any birthdays or anniversaries? We didn't get anybody this morning. None we missed. All right, good. We're going to stand together, take up our evening offering. Number 361. Heavenly Sunlight 361. We'll sing all three verses. Take a raving off and ask the ushers to come out the last verse, 361. 361. One inside.
our offering this evening. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you. We can be here to hear your word preach to us. Thank you for this church that preaches the whole counsel of God. Thank you, dear Lord, for that. Uh, I pray for this offering. Bless the gift and the giver. Please uh, uh, help it to spread the gospel throughout our city and throughout our land and throughout the whole world. Please, dear Lord. Uh, and thank you for everything you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. quieter there was just some technical difficulties and lord willing we have that all figured out so i know I, i'm sure you picked up on that because he was getting quiet and getting loud not on purpose he was just doing that so apologize about that 
preach this morning, but hopefully we have that figured out here tonight. 11, Hebrews chapter number 11, we're going to read verses 1 through 6. Did I say Hebrews 6? Okay, good. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. I think we were here uh, this last week, but Hebrews chapter 11, we'll be looking throughout the Bible in the next, uh, Lord willing, just a few weeks about faith. Faith is so important in a Christian's life. Obviously, faith, we'll talk about tonight, saving faith. Uh, you can't be a Christian without saving faith. That's just the beginning of it. Uh, however, we need so much more than just a saving faith. Hebrews 11, verse 1 through 6. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, for by what? For by faith. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen are not made of things which do appear. That seems to be to be blatantly anti-evolution. Because they say things appear and that they came up. No, that's not, that is not the way it worked. And hopefully I'm not reminding you about Sunday school. But by faith, verse 4, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And was not found because he had because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Father we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for faith. God we're thankful for what we heard this morning. God and the singing tonight. The preparation for the preaching of the word of God. Thank you, Lord, for the rain we got today. And I pray, God, that you'd help us as we open your word tonight, that we would afresh and new understand this doctrine of faith. God, that you would. We come to you like the disciples did so many years ago. Lord, increase our faith. That's our desire tonight, that we would have more than just a saving faith, that our faith would grow and increase. God, not just saying we have more faith, but by our works would prove that our faith is increasing on a daily basis. Speak to hearts, I pray, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing uh, for so long. As we think about faith, I, uh, as the offering was getting ready to be given, it made me think too about uh, we ought to be living by faith. We ought to be giving by faith as we continue. I want to thank our church for being, being faithful to Faith Promise Missions. Our Faith Promise Missions has stayed consistent from the commitments you made earlier in the year. But let's continue on with that. Faith Promise Missions is this, as I was taught by uh, a man that was on the mission field, actually helped his missionary out with this, because his missionary in Haiti was teaching on giving by faith to missions. And he said that uh, you got to give, and you got to know that God's going to give to you to give the money. One of his men said, oh no, Brother Bob, here's the way I do it. He said, I give what I have. And by the way, they don't have anything. He said, I give what I have. Now that's the money I have for rent and groceries, I give that knowing that God will repl replenish it. I give the money I have knowing that God will replenish that. How many Americans give that way? We tend to give on what we can afford to give. All of God's people said amen. It's been a long time since we've given by faith. To where we've given and said, God, here, I know you wanted me to give this, and God, I committed this to you, and God, I'm going to give it to you, but God, if you don't give back to me, I'm not going to have any groceries this week, which some of us could do without groceries for a week, and we'd be okay. Uh, God, I'm not going to have any gas to get to work. God, I won't be able to pay my light bill, but God, this money's been promised to you, so by faith, I'm going to give it, knowing, God, that you will supply. We're going to talk about some things by faith heard earlier, so I thought I'd hit where the rubber meets the road, because when it comes to things like that, everything else we can talk about doing by faith, but when it, really, when it comes to giving things that we don't have to by faith to God, knowing that God will provide, God will provide. As the psalmist said, I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen his righteous forsaken, nor, ne, I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Because the righteous know that sometimes I'm going to have to learn to give by faith. I'm not going to talk about that tonight because I know that's going over like a lead balloon. So we'll talk about something else. But I thought I'd just throw that out there. We got to learn to live by faith. Like some examples. Of course, the Bible's full of examples. I think about the widow woman whose husband died. And we heard the message about that during the youth conference. Who's the widow woman. Of course, she's a widow woman because her husband died. But he had left some debts. And the debtors came. And they said, we're going to take your sons to pay off your husband's debt. She went to the man of God and said, I have nothing. I, I can't raise money anyway. How do I do this? 
And he said, go out and, and borrow some vessels. And he said this, borrow not a few. The great thing about that story is this. The woman went out and she sent her boys out. And they went and they borrowed every vessel in the town. Because they knew that what the man of God told them to do was going to be okay. And when she had poured out, by the way, she had this one little vessel. And she was filling vessels that were bigger than this vessel. So she took this littler vessel filling a bigger vessel and they put it aside and boys bring me another one. And as long as they had vessels, there was oil. And I like the, the end of that, the middle of that story where bring me another vessel and there, there, there are no more vessels. You know, because by faith, they went out and got everyone they possibly could. By faith, they, they, they didn't know what, because he didn't tell them what was, you know, he just said, go do this. And then he said, now pour out the oil. But by faith, they just obeyed and did what God told them to do. Hebrews eleven six. 6, the Bible says, He that cometh to God, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. I would hope, my, my desire is that every person that comes to church is one that wants to please God. I know that may not be true, but I expect it to be. And on Sunday nights, I would really hope that you're here tonight because you want to please God. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a reward of them that diligently seek him. First, we have got to believe. The Bible says, he that cometh to God. I don't know about you, but I remember the day that I came to God. I remember that day. There's days I'll never forget. I'll, there's a lot of days I'll never forget. I'll never forget standing on February the 5th of 1994. <laughs> I almost blew the year <laughs> of 1994. I'll never forget standing there and saying, I do. It's a good day in my life. I'll, I remember that day. And for all the other husbands in here, you remember that day, don't you? A good place to say amen. I'll never forget that day. <laughs> a better day, though, was the day I trusted Christ as my Savior. I remember the day that I came to Him. I came to him not knowing how. Now, I knew what the Bible said about getting saved. I was born and raised in church. I knew how the Bible said I was a sinner. I knew that I couldn't get to heaven. I knew that I had to trust him to get me there, but I had no idea how it worked. I came by faith, saying, God, if you just take me as a little sinner boy, I'll, I'm, I'm placing myself in your hands. I'm trusting you to get me into heaven. I placed my faith in him for salvation. Isn't that, by the way, isn't that easy to do? said this a while back, I'll say it again. People, as we go soul winning, people will say that you believe in easy believism. If they say that, just tell them, well, I don't believe in hard believism. Amen right there. I don't believe I got to jump through a hoop. I don't believe I got to walk so many steps. I don't believe I got to go through a confirmation. I believe I got to do like the Philippian jailer did in Acts 16, 33. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, well, you got to go to all these classes, and then you got to do this, and then you got to do that. No, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shall be saved, and thy house. Now, I believe a person, and the idea of easy belief is, and I believe a person has to know they're a sinner. We can't just walk up to some random stranger and say, hey, you're going to go to heaven because you're going to say this prayer, say the prayer, and you're done. No, they got to understand why they're a sinner and the penalty, and they got to know that Jesus paid it. We got to explain some things to understand that, but we don't got to get them to jump through hoops and do these things. How do they get saved? By faith, the same way you and I got saved. I'm glad for the day that I got saved. He made me his child. I'll never forget that day. Saving faith. Understanding there was nothing I could do to earn God's favor, that saving faith. But tonight, I, I hope I'm preaching to a bunch of saved people. If not, I was just brother, hearing Brother McKeon preach earlier before church. One, one good thing about Facebook is I get to listen to him preach, and then I get to come out here and yell at you guys because he made me all mad. No. It was a helpful message. I was so thankful for it. But he said he heard a survey recently of how many people, the percentage of people that are sitting in church unsaved. Read the, par the parable of the ten virgins. How many of them had no oil? Oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Spirit of God, you're none of His. Do you have saving faith? Do you know that you... Can you go back? Preacher tonight was saying that. I said, I feel like going like I did at youth camp and walking, down, walking up and down the aisles with a microphone and asking people, tell me when you got saved. When did you trust Christ as Savior? Tell me about the day you got saved. Hallelujah, your eyes are getting big. 
I may not do it, but that response, I might do it. Tell me about the day you got saved. I can tell you about the day I got saved. I can tell you about the day Brother Di got saved. I've heard his testimony. Thank God the, the, the grass was greener. The, tr the, trees were, the trees were greener. The sun, the, shine, the sun shined brighter. Everything was better. There was a change in his life the day he got saved. Now, he was an adult when he got saved. But he, I, I was a kid when I got saved. He wasn't in church when he got saved. Wasn't really raised in church. But it took as much grace to save me as it did to save him. But here's the thing. He, was, he may have sinned more than I did because I was just a little nine-year-old boy. But the day he got saved, God changed his life. But guess what? The day I got saved, God changed my life too. Now, I didn't, I, you know, my, my testimony is that I was, I grew up behind bars. I was handed from woman to woman. There was always a bottle in my face. I grew up in the church, in the church nursery. If you know what I'm talking about behind bars, you need to see some of these old church nurseries where there was nursery along the wall and there were just bars up and down the wall and it was like three stacked high. Hallelujah. But the day, I remember the day I got saved. Do you remember the day you got saved? Because I'm, the Bible says in 1 Peter uh, 1, uh, in, somewhere in 1 Peter 1, 2 Peter 1, but and beside all this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. So faith is foundational, but without saving faith, you can't add to your faith anything. Do you know that you know that you've been born again? Well, preacher, you're preaching to a Sunday night crowd. I know that. But I was in church Sunday nights for nine years before I got saved. My wife was an assistant pastor's wife for uh, three and a half, three years before she got saved. In church all the time. I don't want just to assume that everybody's born again. Please don't go to hell from True Light Baptist Church. Have you been born again? Do you have that saving faith? I planned a short message tonight, but I'm, about, I'm through about two lines of my notes. God wants more than just saving faith for us. But we got to have that saving faith first. The husband that laboreth must first be partaker of the fruit. Faith is defined as this. By the way, there's not just faith. I have to back up sometimes and realize that when I think about things, most of the time I'm thinking about what the Bible says about it. But faith is about, there's faith for sure in the Bible. There's other faith. And people would say, well, but I'm not a person of faith. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. There's a lot of people that you were driving here to church tonight, and by faith you stuck your foot out and you pushed that brake pedal. And you were fully expecting, now you didn't understand how it works. You didn't know that when you push that, that the, the brake fluid inside there would fill the chambers that would squeeze the calipers, that hopefully you had brake pads, and hopefully your disc, your drums are, were good enough to slow you down, that you didn't have to stop and say, I hope all that's in there. You just put your foot by faith, and you push that brake pedal, and you stopped. For those of you who drove a Ford to church tonight, you had faith that you pushed that gas pedal and it would actually get moving. And it got here. God is a miracle working God. By faith, you came into church tonight, you got a hymn book, and you got done singing finally after a real long song service. And thank you, you may be seated. Nobody, I, I didn't want, see one person walk up to your chair and say, when was that thing built? Are those good legs? Is that strong enough to hold me? What's the weight capacity on that chair? You just by blind faith sat down. We exercise faith all the time. How about we learn to exercise faith in God? Here's faith defined in Webster's 1828 dictionary. Faith is defined as belief. The ascent of the mind to the truth of what is declared by another. Resting on his authority and veracity without other evidence. I've heard this so much recently. I've heard this so much recently that people have lost faith in the media. And I said, well, to lose it, first I have to have it. They said they lost, you know why? Because it says here, the ascent of the mind to the truth of what is declared by another. When a person lies all the time, I'm not just talking about the media, but when somebody lies, you lose faith in them. You've heard that. 
Now, faith in theology is what we're talking about tonight. Webster's 1828 says this about faith in theology. It's the ascent of the mind or understanding to the truth of what God has revealed. I like this. Simple belief of the scriptures. Jesus said it this way, childlike faith. Except you have the faith of a child. That's what you learn to have is simple childlike faith of if the Bible says it, I believe it. Amen. I believe the Bible. Why? Because I by faith believe the Bible. Well, many, many reasons because the Bible's never been wrong. But by faith, the just shall live by his faith. The just shall live by faith. That is, it's written, the just shall live by faith. I have faith in this because I know it's always been right. But even if I didn't know it's always been right, from a child, I'm, I know Paul talking to me there in 1 Timothy, where he tells him, where he tells Timothy, but he told Matt Wooten too, and from a child, thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. And from a child, I was taught that these are right and you can believe them. As a child, I didn't, I didn't have to have proof of it. I was just told, and I believed it by faith, I knew it was right. Now, by the way, everything that's ever happened in my life, has, whether it's been good or bad, I can back it up by the Bible and say, yep, the Bible's right. But I don't need to prove it to believe it. I believe it by faith. By faith, the consent of the mind of believing the, what God has revealed, simple belief in the Scriptures of the being and perfections of God and of the being, existence, and doctrines of Christ founded on the sacred writers. That's what the faith we're looking at tonight is simple belief of the scriptures. Not, and I'm thankful, I've, I've said this recently, I'll keep saying to the day I die, I'm thankful for the generation that went before me and handed down the doctrines of the word of God to me, but I don't believe, I don't believe them simply because mom and dad did. I don't believe them simply because my pastors did. I don't believe them simply because my pastor does. Do you know why? Because as much as I love these guys, and I brag about their die all the time, how he's done, and him and his wife done so well for them. You know what? They're wonderful people, but guess what? They're still just people. I don't mean this disrespectful toward anybody I've mentioned tonight, or all the heroes of the faith. They're wonderful people, but they're people, and guess what? They've been wrong before. But, and so I wanted to make sure they were right. So you know what I did? I decided to study this book and see if what they taught me was right. And guess what? What they taught me was right and it was true. And I can believe the scriptures. Simple faith. That, but if you don't know what you don't know, how are you going to know what you know? Study and believe the scriptures. We'll look at a few things about faith tonight and then we'll, we'll go home and learn to exercise our faith. You're in Hebrews 11. Well, let's look at verses 23 through 29. We'll read those real fast. So I know last week we read the entire chap book, I'm sorry, the entire chapter of Hebrews 11. We didn't read the entire book of Hebrews. I don't want to scare anybody from coming back to church. We, all we read was chapter 11. But chapter 11, verses 23 through 29 shows us the faith of Moses. But not just Moses. Moses was a man of faith, and I believe this because his parents were people of faith. Hebrews 11, 23, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. By the way, child of God, we, before we read the rest of those, if we would say, but Moses didn't know what it was like to have the pleasures. Right? Moses had the pleasures of Egypt at his fingertips. Yeah, you think Vegas is sin city. Study Egypt. Egypt in the Word of God in the Word of God is always a picture of the world and how bad that it is. But especially here, Egypt itself, boy, the pleasures of sin, everything, anything Moses could have ever dreamed of was there at his beck and call, being the grandson of the Pharaoh, being his, his uh, mom or stepmom, if you will. By the way, wasn't it great that when Moses was hidden the brushes and then Miriam was the one that uh, saw Pharaoh's daughter bathing and Pharaoh's daughter heard the baby cry and she ran up right away and said, hey, you need somebody to nurse that baby for you. Can I find? Sure, go find somebody. She, of course, went and got mom. So Moses' mom got to raise her boy, train him to go to the palace, train him in faith to do what he was supposed to do. He didn't learn faith in God in Pharaoh's daughter's house. 
He learned it in his parents' house. Thank you, Lord. I wasn't even thinking about that earlier. Verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with people of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasure in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch him. As we look at Moses' life here, just these few verses tonight, I want to look at, first of all, more than just saving faith. Here's what God wants to do. He wants to strengthen our faith. More than just saving faith, he wants to strengthen our faith. There's a few in the room that would understand this. Okay, Trenton was a football player good football player, all-state football player, more than one time. Trent, if you never picked up any weights, you would, have, you would have maybe done okay, but they would have tackled you a whole lot easier. They would have made you fumble the ball, because I know you never fumble. Inside story. Okay? He knows what it's like to need to get stronger. Let me, let me, let me ask the congregation this. Trent knows the answer to this. Did he get stronger by sitting there and doing nothing and just saying, I'm going to be a good fullback? fullback I'm gonna be a good fullback I'm gonna plow through the line I'm gonna never fumble that ball I'm gonna drag tacklers with me now those are all things I'm sure he wanted to do and all that but if he just sat there and thought that he probably never would even have made the team much less been a starter much less being a an all whatever he was all state whatever it was congratulations for all that brother Potts is on a, a weightlifting team brother Potts if you were still working out with those pink eight pound dumbbells still work he still does okay maybe a bad example if you were still working out with those and curling with them and squatting with them and pressing with them you probably wouldn't do real well next time you went to a meet what I'm saying is it's easy to sit there and get excited about I'm going to do something for God. I'm going to do this. I'm going to stand for God. But unless we strengthen our faith, we're not going to achieve anything. Right. But strengthening your faith can be hard. Just like strengthening your body can be hard. My younger brother in Tucson, notice I didn't say little brother in Tucson. His nickname is Tiny Tim. And it's because he's not tiny. Now, he was, uh, let's see, six, I don't know, he's a big old mountain of a man. He's funny because he's a big guy, looks mean, but he's what, a big teddy bear. Uh, don't tell us uh, anybody like that because he's still raising daughters, and all the boys in Tucson still are and should be afraid of his daughters. But while he was in high school, he you know, worked out, big, strong kid. He got out of high school. I was living in Tucson, and he tells me this, hey, Matt, let's go join a gym. I can join a gym. I grew up working kind of strong. He said, we'll go to the gym the night after work. Sure, I went to the gym with him. And when your little brother invites you to the gym, he can't outlift you. That just doesn't happen. Now, some of you are like, well, no big deal. That's because you don't have a younger brother. Your younger brother, it's just, it's, it's physically impossible. It can't happen. In my mind, it just could not happen. And I was so proud of myself because Tim's a lot bigger than me. He was stronger than me. And I kept up with him with everything I did. And it was strengthening me, but it hurt not then. I mean, I, I was kept up. But the very next day, boy, did it hurt. I woke up to go to work. And I, what? I wasn't an old guy. I was, you know, maybe 20, maybe 21. And I woke up to go to work and I jumped, I jumped out of bed. We didn't work legs. We just worked upper body because that's what teenage boys do. They don't work legs. They just work upper body. I jumped out of bed, no problem, and I, and I went to go put my shirt on, and my arms weren't working. And I was trying to, even that night, I had to go and frame houses, thinking, how in the world am I going to pick up my saw and nail gun and everything, and my arms are not working. I mean, if you've never worked out, you don't know what I'm talking about, but if you have, you know what I'm saying. I could not move anything. How am I going to drive to work? I drove with my knees. I got my arm up there to pull the deal down. I cut, it, was, it was a mess. It hurt. But if I kept going to the gym, it would strengthen those muscles. Child of God, we want to grow our faith, but most Christians won't grow their faith because to grow their faith, it's going to hurt a little bit. To strengthen your faith, it's going to take you beyond your comfort level. How do you strengthen your faith, preacher? I'm glad you asked. First of all, trials will help strengthen your faith. I see here, mentioned earlier in, in introduction, not the invitation, in the introduction, 
We saw that Moses' parents were people of faith in verse number 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents. They saw that he was a proper child, and knowing this, knowing that he was a proper child, they still hid him, knowing that there were severe penalties for doing such things. This act, I know, obviously saved Moses' life, but it didn't just save Moses' life, it strengthened Moses' faith. Have you ever thought about that? Moses, the great man of the faith, such a great man of the faith, that a portion of Hebrews 11, the hall of faith, not just one verse, not just one mention, but a portion, a chunk of it, is dedicated to Moses. I've already answered this question, but let me ask you this. Did Moses develop that faith under the tutelage of Pharaoh's daughter? Where did Moses get that faith? I'm going to put Mike Bach on the spot and ask you this. Mike, the faith you have today, did you get it all by yourself? Or did your, your giant of the faith of mom, did she give you some of that? It was hand, your, his little, I'm sorry? My little mama did. His little mama did. All due respect, Mrs. Baca. But others in the room tonight, you have faith. And now some, you are a first generation Christian, praise God for that. But I'm thankful that my parents were people of faith. And before you say, but my parents were, yeah, weren't, but yeah, you are, and you hand that down. Pick on Billy Goddess when he's back. I can pick on him again. He didn't, he didn't have a mom of faith. In fact, when I got saved, my parents were excited. They were happy. When he got saved, there's problems in the house, weren't there? But guess what? His faith now and his wife's faith, now once they got saved and decided to raise their kids under faith, guess what? Now they've got kids that are serving God. You know why? Because they were people of faith and their kids learned through the trials of their parents' life, it's not easy raising the herd they raised. By faith, God provided. Just like in Moses' life. I encourage you tonight, listen, I don't care if you're a first, second, third, tenth generation Christian, you've got to take that faith and learn through the trials to let God strengthen your faith so that your children will become people of faith. Well, preacher, that doesn't guarantee that they will. I know, but if I get outside of the will of God and I don't live by faith, it'll almost guarantee that my kids will go the wayside. Here by it. But I'm going to live by faith. I want to do like Moses' parents did. And they trained him up, but through trials, they did that. The act, I'm sure, most strengthened Moses' faith. Trials have a great way of strengthening our faith. As you exercise faith in God in the midst of your trials, your faith is strengthened. Not only through trials, but troubles in our life. Job went through a series of troubles that revealed where his strength was. These troubles also strengthened his faith in God. Job, in the beginning, the Bible says that Job was a perfect and upright man, one that feared God and shewed evil. And all this stuff came, and all these troubles came, and Job didn't know why they were coming, and it was a mess. And still, Job, he made those great words, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That showed where his strength was, but it also helped to strengthen him later on. Not only that, but it's helped strengthen Christians for thousands of years now. These troubles strengthen his faith in God. Job 23, where Job said, listen, I, I can't find him. I know where he's at. I go forward, he's not there. And backward, can't find him. To the right, to the left. I don't know where he's at. I don't, I'm not quoting right there. But verse number 10 says this. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job was strong, but he got stronger during his troubles. You want to get stronger in your faith? It's going to take trials. It's going to take troubles. I don't want to scare you off. I want you to, yes, okay, God, and, and God, I'm ready for them. Lord, give me a little bit more. Now, Lord, I don't want, you know, I'm starting right with this regular barbell that weighs 45 pounds. God, don't throw five or six weights on there right now, God. Little by little, but Lord, bring me up. Strengthen me. Help me to be strengthened in my faith. Because when you pray to be strengthened in your faith, God will do it. It's like praying for patience. 
Be careful. Good thing, pray for it, but be careful. Job didn't know why he was going through these times, but one thing was for sure, his faith was strengthened. Ours can be as well. Talking about troubles, here's another trouble that helped strengthen people throughout the years. Job had a lot of troubles. Job had lost all of his riches, all of everything. He had all of his cattle, all of his children, even his health. But he kept his life. So let me ask you this. Here's a trouble that I think would be pretty big trouble. How about being killed? Would that be a pretty big trouble? Now, I know we go to heaven we die, but being killed by your own brother. Do you know why Cain killed his brother? Because he was able. Anyway, he was 11 4. I couldn't help it. I tried, but I couldn't help it. <laughs> you know what's bad when a die shakes his head? Says, oh my goodness, that's not good. <laughs> Hebrews 11, verse number 4. The Bible says this By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Why was Abel's a more excellent sacrifice? Because it was the one that God wanted to bring. Cain brought of all the fruit of the ground. Cain had brought all the stuff he, was, he thought was because they were works of his hand. And I don't know, but I'm. I'm, I'm pretty sure the Bible uh, doesn't bear it out. It doesn't say that, that um, Adam and Eve sat down and told them, here's what you have to do. But God accepted Abel's sacrifice, which was the blood of an innocent lamb. Because by the way, that was the sacrifice that was made by, for Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve brought the work of their own hands. They sewed fig leaves together. And God said, no, that ain't going to do it. The lamb had to die. Cain brought a fruit of the ground. The same thing that his mom and dad brought. God didn't accept that, but God he accepted Abel's sacrifice. His parents taught him the right thing and he listened. And it was good. Cain didn't listen and it didn't, go out, didn't work out so well. What do you mean it didn't work out so well? Abel got killed and Cain lived. Yeah, but see what the Word of God says in verse number 4 of Hebrews 11. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. Oh, but Cain, Abel was killed for doing right. I hate to burst your bubble. And if, and if I do right, I might die. Let me, let me let you live on something. There's only two ways to check out of this world. The rapture. I hope that happens while I'm alive. Or by death. It's the point a man wants to die. We're all going to die someday. How, wouldn't it be so much better to die living in the will of God, to die going out like Abel did, and he being dead yet speaketh? He's giving us a great testimony of faith. By his trouble, our faith can be strengthened. Not only in trials and troubles, but in temptations, our faith can be strengthened. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse 13. I see people nodding off, so we better turn to the Word of God to keep you from falling asleep. Don't feel bad because if I was not preaching, I'd probably be nodding off as well. I know what it's like on Sunday afternoon. I got a good nap in today, so I'm ready for three and a half hours with the preach tonight. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. That's not the one I wanted. Is it second? No, I'm in second Corinthians. Yes, first Corinthians. I'm sorry. I got to turn to the correct book of the Bible. First Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Oh, and by the way, can I, can I give that other part of that verse first? There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But you don't understand, I couldn't handle it. I, I fell. Here's a bad one. Don't, don't say I fell in temptation. Quit being a liar because then you're adding a lie on top of the sin you committed. You didn't fall in temptation. You rolled your britches up. You jumped in knowing what's going on. Hallelujah. You'll get more help quicker that way if you get real with yourself and say, Hey, I, know what I, I knew what I was doing wrong. I chose to do wrong. If you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit of God was telling you, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And you quench the Holy Spirit of God. You know how I know that the temptation wasn't too hard for you to bear? Because the Word of God says, there hath, taken, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. I know it's Sunday night, we can still run and shout and swing from the chandeliers right there, but God is faithful. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. 
Believe it or not, temptations can strengthen our faith. We're not tempted of God. When the temptation comes, God, who is faithful, makes a way out. Here's the way I look at that as I, as I uh, have had and I now, thankfully, have a, another motorcycle. When I ride, I don't ride scared. But I ride making sure as I look out, if I see cars up there, I'm ready in case they pull in front of me. If I see him, I'm driving, riding down the road, I see a car pulling here. I'm ready, not expecting, but just supposing he pulls out. I've got a way. I've already made up my mind. I can go this way. It's better, Brother Richard, you've been through motorcycle lives. It's better to run into a ditch than run into a building. He's ran into a building before, and he survived. I, anyway, it's a miracle Brother Rick's still alive. But thank God. What I'm saying is I've always got a way out. Get out just in case. Lay it down. Slide into the car is a whole lot better than catapulting over the motorcycle. Have a way out. Just as important or more important than that is God has always provided. When you're tempted, He's always provided a means of escape that you'll be able to bear it. Listen, if I'm riding my motorcycle and a car pulls out in front of me and I'm able to lay it over and go into a ditch and get a few scratches, okay. Or I can just be stubborn and say, you know what, I don't care. I'm going to ram into that car and see what happens. That'd just be stupid, wouldn't it? How many children of God are that stupid with their lives? I know, listen, I, I, can, I cannot fall into this temptation. I can go get right with God and suffer the, in, in their mind the embarrassment of admitting I've gotten into sin. The devil gets you all mixed up thinking that way. Because when you get right, there'll be a lot of people shouting and rejoicing with you. Amen. From a guy that knows by experience, there'll be a lot of people shouting and rejoicing and saying, praise God, the idiot got right with God. They may not say that about you, but they said it about me, and I'm thankful that I did. Suffer that little embarrassment instead of running head on to that sin and then just finding the ruin of your life. Instead of that, Take the means of escape that God gave us. And when we start to do that, when we're, when we're faced with temptation, because you will be faced with temptation. Well, I can't wait today. I get old enough. I won't be tempted anymore. <laughs> Young people, ask any person you consider to be old what age they quit being tempted. And they'll tell you, I'll let you know when that happens. I know when it happens. When they're laying in front of the pulpit in a wooden box. I guess they're not wooden anymore, they're high dollar ornate things, but anyway, what I'm saying is that's when they'll no longer be tempted. So listen, when the temptation comes, God makes a way out. And through that, your faith can be strengthened. We have to endure temptations that our faith can be stronger. The trials, troubles, and temptations that we go through are allowed by or given to us by God because He wants to strengthen our faith. I'm sure that God does not want a bunch of weak Christians with no faith. He's already picked it by Trenton and Brother Potts. I'll get about him again. But Trent, if there were guys in the football team that are putting no effort forward, they never hit the weights and all that, as probably one of the leaders on the team, you probably encouraged them to do more than they were doing. Because... I mean, I know, of course, when you're in high school, it's not just a football game, but it's just a football game, but you still want the best by your side. But the pots, you got guys that come in and they're, they're a, a string bean and they want to they lift all this weight, but they put no effort in. Well, good luck, buddy, but you're not going to be on the team. Now, if you're putting forth effort and you're working, you're going, that's what God wants from His children. He wants everybody on the team, but He wants us working and exercising and strengthening our faith. See that documentary about, I don't, I don't like it at all, but that documentary about that little robot that builds things in the future, that little robot that takes care of trash, Wally. -E. Whoever wrote that is like a prophet. You know, watch, I've never seen the movie, I've seen parts of it, where there's a bunch of fat people sitting around on a, watching a screen. The guy's like a prophet, so there's a bunch of fat people sitting around looking at his screen everywhere they go and doing nothing but sitting there and just watching a screen and doing nothing I mean God's people are so much the same way just sitting around and doing nothing and not exercising their faith let me ask you this is your faith stronger today than it was 15 months ago or whenever this mess started if so 
you've passed the test sent your way. If not, because I'd be goofy to think that everybody I'm talking to today has a stronger faith now than they did a year and a half ago. If not, be honest. But you need to get real and right with God and allow Him to strengthen your faith. God wants to strengthen your faith. Number two, our faith. Let me say it this way. God wants to strengthen our faith. Number two, God wants to settle us by faith. 1 Peter chapter number 5 and verse number 10. 1 Peter 5.10 if you would please. 1 Peter 5.10. He wants to settle us by faith. 1 Peter 5.10. You read through the Bible and you, you, you get verses or things that just jump out at you. Another one I like here tonight. 1 Peter 5.10, the beginning of that. But the God of all grace. Don't just read through it and not pay attention to things like that. But the God of all grace. Hallelujah right there. But the God of all grace who hath called us into His eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After that ye have suffered a while. We just talked about that. You get strengthened by suffering. After ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. After ye have suffered a while. Somebody told me this here a while back. They said, Marriage is kind of like a three ring circus. First, there's the engagement ring. And then there's the wedding ring. And then there's the suffer ring. <laughs> After that, you have suffered a while. You're going to suffer. And I'm not just talking about in marriage. In your Christian life, you're going to suffer. After you have suffered a while. Well, I want to be a giant of the faith, but I don't want to suffer. Well, then you're never going to grow in your faith. Again, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be asking God, God, make me suffer. Just ask God, strengthen my faith. And in order to strengthen your faith, you will suffer, but be ready for it to come. Because after you have suffered a while, He'll make you perfect. Understand what that word means. It doesn't mean you'll never sin again. It means you make you complete, make you mature as you grow in Christ. Make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. That word settle there uh, gives the idea of this, to lay the foundation. Isn't that what Peter told us earlier? Where he said, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and all those things. But to lay the groundwork, to lay the foundation, to ground you, to settle you. And not ground you like what teenagers are used to. You're grounded. No, to ground you, to give you some stability. Would to God that our, that our that church people today, myself included, had the stability that God would want us to have. And not be carried about by every wind of doctrine. And things that are, I'm not carried about by wind of doctrine. But there are things in the world that, that get my attention pretty easily. They get my eyes off of Christ too easily. I've got to be settled by faith. We will not always understand how it's going to work out. Isn't that how so many people want to know? Oh, our last point, we'll get to it eventually, is stepping out by faith. A lot of people will step out by faith as long as they know how things will work out. Pastor Lang this morning mentioned that, that he's ran to a lot of people throughout the nation that have said, God called me to whatever. You know one reason that I'm sure some of them didn't go? Because they didn't know how God was going to work things out. A lot of people want to know step by step how God's going to do something. God won't let you know step by step how things are going to happen. Because if you knew step by step, you wouldn't step out by faith. If the Spielmans knew Ukraine like they did 20 how many years ago, they would have never gone to Ukraine. I'm pretty sure. But by faith they stepped out and guess what? God used them. Now God's using them uh, here in the States again. Praise God for that. But the only person I ever know, I've ever heard of, that knew what was going to happen was Saul of Tarsus. Because God told Ananias, he said, for I must show him what great things he must suffer for my sake. But Paul still went and did it. You know why God hasn't showed you and me? Because we wouldn't go and do it. We don't know how it's going to work, but God wants to settle us. What He wants to do is strengthen us through faith and, and get us stronger so that He can settle us. Say, here, I'm going to, I'm, it's going to be okay. Acts 27, case in point. I'm doing my best to get us out of here before tomorrow. Acts 27. 
If we learn, if we would just learn to walk by faith, to live by faith, God will work out the details for us. I'll never forget as I was working there on staff at Rio Grande Baptist, loved my time there. I enjoy, had a great time, loved working with Pastor Wood, loved working with Pastor Boggs. God taught me so much there, enjoyed my time, but I had, I had clear direction. I fasted and prayed and knew that God wanted me and my family to move to Santa Clara, California and to go to Bible college. When we made that decision, finally, I called up Pastor Gordon Rogers uh, there in, in Rocky Mountain Baptist in Pueblo. He had such a big influence on my life as well. And I told him, Brother Rogers, here's, I believe, what God is going to have me do. And he said, Brother Matt, here's how it'll work out. He said, years ago when you came on staff here at Rio Grande, he said that was kind of, and don't think about it this way, but that was a stepping stone. And then now you're going to Bible college, and that's going to be, you'll look back and know that that was a stepping stone. And later on, God will have another stepping stone. And you'll look back and say, okay, God, now I'm I see how it worked out. You've heard this before. You'll hear it again tonight. It would have made sense for me, for me to stay at Rio Grande for all these years and then just drive the 17 miles from Rio Grande to Los Lunas. That would have made sense. But we did it the Wooten way and not always making sense. We went from Rio Grande, 17 miles, via Santa Clara, Salinas, Apache Creek, Los Lunas. That's a long way to get to Los Lunas. But you know what God was doing? He was settling us. He was laying the foundation. He was getting us ready to serve right here in this place. Now God may not have to do that for you, but He'll settle you somehow. He'll make things work out like He did for Paul in Acts 27. He'll work out the details. In Acts 27, beginning at verse number 14, Paul started on a journey that didn't go exactly as planned, but God settled him, and by faith, Paul was able to help others. Acts 27, verse number 14, but not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurachlodon. They're in a ship right now in a boat trying to get somewhere. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up under the wind, we let her drive. And, dry, and running under a certain island, which is called Claudia, uh, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used help undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand, straight sail, and so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with the tempest, the next day they lied the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that are in the that are that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. Second time Paul told him that, by the way. And here's why he said it. For I believe God that it shall be even. You know why he said, you know, I believe God, not because Steve Stucker came on and said, Paul, the weather's gonna be fine. It was the angel of God. I don't think Steve Tucker's an angel of God. He's, I believe he's a Christian. But anyway, wait, he didn't worry about all that was going on. There was one reason. He said, be of good cheer, for I believe God. Why? By faith. Paul believed God. I believe God that it shall be, even as it was told unto me. Howbeit, we must be cast upon a certain island. And But when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in a, a Adria, about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country and sounded and found it 20 fathoms. When they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon the rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. Here Paul in his life, Paul didn't know how it was going to work out, but by faith, because God had told Paul, you're going to end up getting where you're going to go. But through this, Paul was able to be settled because of his faith. But not just Paul's faith, all the men in the ship. A couple times he told us, he told them what we need to hear tonight, but be of good cheer. <clears throat> Can't tell you often, I've said this and I've heard other preachers and other people say things like this, we're living in dark hours. Yes, we are. But be of good cheer, for I believe God. It's, by the way, 
It's been darker at times in American history. It's been darker at times in human history. But the God of heaven is still the God of heaven. And I'm still His child. And if He wants me to go through this time in order to strengthen me, in order to establish me, in order to settle me, then God, let me go through it and strengthen my faith. Let's not live on that downer side. The whole world is way down in the dumps. I don't want to live there. That's why I kicked Hank Williams out of my house. I don't want to live down in the dumps anymore. You have no idea what I'm talking about. Thank God. Strengthen and settle our faith. That's what faith is supposed to do. Paul didn't just help himself, but look at verse number 44. He helped others as well. Verse 44, and the rest, now after the ship was broken to pieces, and, and the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship, and so it came to pass that they escaped. How many saved the land? All, All saved the land. You know what Paul's faith did? Paul's faith, even though these guys didn't listen to him, Still, his faith in God saved others. And that's what your faith in God and my faith in God will do. It will help others. It'll settle us. It'll lay the foundation for others. That's, that's what Jesus' life was all about, was others. And that's what our life is supposed to be about, is helping others. Too many today wanting things and help for self. And we need help every now and then for self, but... One way you'll find such great satisfaction and help in your life is as you help others grow in their faith. He wants to strengthen our faith. He wants to settle us in the faith. And then back in Hebrews 11, he wants us to step out by faith. He wants us to step out by faith. We read there in, in 11, verse 24 through 29, by faith Moses did this, by faith Moses, uh, by faith Moses, Again, choosing rather to suffer affliction of the people of God. Verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ. By the way, the reproach of Christ is greater treasures than anything else. And if you step out, or let me say it this way, when you step out by faith, not if, because it shouldn't be, I shouldn't say if, I should challenge you, when you step out by faith, you will get reproached. Some people will congratulate you, Others, and by the way, it won't just be the unsaved crowd. Hallelujah. It won't just be the unsaved crowd. When you step out by faith, expect other saved people to reproach you. Really? I'm, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing the blank look up. That won't happen. Really? <clears throat> and then I'm seeing the look of people saying, yes, I've been down that road before. They won't do it necessarily because they're not wanting something for God to happen. They'll do it because they know they should be exercising their faith as well. And you stepping out by faith is making them miserable. So they'll attack you because they're miserable. That's what we do as people. But don't let that stop you from stepping out by faith. Moses... He didn't make all of his countrymen happy when he stood up before Pharaoh and said, let my people go. God said, let my people go. A lot of people weren't very happy because then, then Pharaoh got mad and said, hey, those guys are playing around. Take away their straw. Make, they're still got to make the bricks. Let them go gather all their own material. And they still got to make the same amount of bricks. And they're coming to Moses saying, Moses, quit stepping out by faith. This ain't working out well for us. Now, eventually, they were thankful I'm not talking about just getting out of Egypt. I'm talking about years and years and years later when their kids walked into the promised land, then they were thankful because they weren't thankful wandering around in the wilderness murmuring and complaining. And as we shake our heads, remember, we'd be leading the pack murmuring and complaining. How long have we prayed for rain? And then how many people are whining about walking through the water to get back to their car today? Aren't we crazy people? <laughs> Hallelujah. Step out by faith. This is what separates Moses from so many of us today. We say we have faith, but Moses stepped out by faith. Go to James 2 if you would, please. Next couple pages over Hebrews. James chapter number 2. We say we have faith, but Moses stepped out by faith. James chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Even so faith. 
if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. It's easy. It's easy to say, I have faith. But we prove that by stepping out and doing things. It's time for us as God's people to truly step out by faith and get busy in the work of God. I just want to be real with us tonight. Too often, we're knocking on doors and hanging, handing out gospel tracts and thank God for that. But we're doing that simply because we know we're supposed to. And all of God's people said, Amen. If we would change our, it, it would, it will change our soul winning if we step out by faith and go soul winning. How's that one? I think one of the guys at the youth conference said that this week. Faith is kind of like this as you're going out on your rowboat chasing Moby Dick with a knife and tartar sauce. And the kids are looking like, who's Moby Dick? I, I'm sorry. When he said that, I was thinking, remember who you're preaching to. It's a bunch of teens. They have no idea that great big whale. You know it's a huge whale, right? Okay. The funny thing is I'm actually reading that book right now. Not the cartoon version either, but the actual book. And you go, that's what faith is. You're going out knowing something's going to happen. How many times have we gone out? Nobody's going to get saved today. I'm going to knock on the door anyway. We don't say that because we're too spiritual to say that. But have you ever gone out that I have? Have you? Do you expect to lead someone to Jesus every time you talk to them? We should. Heard a story about the young preacher. My dad might have been there hearing the story about the young preacher that talked to Mr. Moody. And he asked Mr. Moody, why do you, because Mr. Moody, by the way, God's hand was on him in a tremendous way. Can I remind you though that D.L. Moody's not the only one that can be filled with the power of God in such a way that he can do great things for God. D.L. Moody didn't hold, the, he didn't hold the corner on having the power of God. He was just willing to have his faith tried and tested enough to get the power of God. The young preacher asked Mr. Moody, why do you see people saved every time you preach? His response to the young man was this, well, you don't, you don't expect folks to get saved every time you preach, do you? The young man said, well, of course not. And he said, therein lies the problem. You preach expecting nothing to happen. And guess what? You're getting what you expect. And here's what we do too often. We try and talk to people about Jesus knowing they're not going to listen to us. Knowing they're not going to hear. And even if they do, they're not going to trust Christ as Savior. Hi, we missed you in church. Would love to have you come back knowing that they're not going to come. And I'm, I'm glad that we have people that call friends and family and text them. But do it in faith. Knowing they're going to come. Oh, preacher, I'm going to let myself down. No, because you want to pray in faith knowing it's going to happen. I know. I know we're going to hit 100 by the end of September. I'm not talking about degrees outside. I'm talking about people in church. Okay? We already hit 100, so we got... No! We're doing well tonight. We're nearly halfway there on a Sunday night. Praise God for that. Guess what? We can get there next Sunday if we all would step by faith and say, God, I know this can happen. <clears throat> We're guilty at times. I throw myself in this for sure. Guilty of going out expecting for people to reject us or not even listen to us. Let's change that around. Let's be guilty of believing by faith that Jesus still saves. We sang it. How many of us believe it? We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Do we believe it? You're going to shake your head because the pastor's asking. And yes, we do believe it. But do we believe it? That's like this question here. Don't, don't shake your head. Don't say yes. Don't say no. Don't say anything. I'm going to close my eyes so I don't see your response. Do you believe hell is real? Don't say anything. Do you believe hell is real? I would say yes, I do. But I'm not warning every person I see that if they die, they're going straight to hell without, if, they don't, if they die without Jesus Christ. If we really believe that hell is real, 
If we really believed that people that die without Jesus Christ go there, we'd be warning even our worst enemies. You need to get saved. We know it's there, but there's still that disconnect. The same idea of our faith. Yes, we have faith. Let's learn to exercise our faith. Here's what I'm going to do for the rest of this year. I'm going to step out by faith this year knowing that God will bless our hard work and grow this church for God's glory. And that's easy to say. i got to remind myself and remind you as well of what James said, that faith without works is dead being alone. It's high time to step out by faith. We'll close with what uh, I looked up the missionary's name earlier. I totally forgot it. He said this, expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. And we do that because the Word of God says so. But can I give you some help and encouragement tonight? Like every other family in this church that has done that, every time we've stepped out by faith, God has seen us through. Hadn't always been easy because He had to strengthen our faith. Hadn't always been easy to put that, you know, again, where the road meets the road, that last bill in there knowing I didn't have enough gas to get home. Or there was no groceries in the cupboards. Just put it in there. You know, wearing the head off that dime before you throw it in there. But stepping out by faith. I'm not just saying giving. I'm everything in our life. Packing up and moving to California. I think we sing that song. I don't know if we sing it, but it may not even be in our hymn book. But there's a song that has this, this little phrase in there, in this low and sinful state. I used to give the guys a hard time to live in California. I said, look, they're singing about California, this low and sinful state, because Death Valley is below sea level. Anyway, just. <laughs> but as we step out by faith and go there, that was not easy. Leave in the city of Albuquerque. Ask Mayor Gerald next time you see him. It's not a hard job working for the city of Albuquerque. Leaving that to go for the glitz and glamour of being a principal of Christian school. And all the great pay that comes with that. And all the wonderful stuff. And, but stepping out by faith. But it's been wonderful every time. But there was that stepping out. But before that stepping out came, God had to strengthen my faith. God had to grow my faith. God had to settle me and get me ready to step out. That's what church services are for. Is to strengthen your faith. To settle your faith. That's what trials and troubles and tribulations and even temptations are for. Is to strengthen your faith. Let's come tonight in the invitation of God, say, God, like the apostles said, increase our faith. We must remember that if we're to please God, the Bible says, the verse we started with, Hebrews eleven six. but without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He's a, re that he's a rewarder of them that occasionally seek Him. Of them that diligently seek Him. We've lost We've lost diligence in churches today. We've lost the diligently seeking of God. God will grow our faith if we diligently seek Him. Father, thank you for your word and I pray to help us tonight. God, that you would increase our faith, that our faith would grow as we step out by faith and do things you'd have us to do. Faith in the word of God. Just knowing, God, that what you say is right, that simple faith we saw earlier in the definition. God, that we would allow you to strengthen our faith. We'd allow you to settle us. And God, then that we would take our part and learn to step out by faith and do what you've called us to do in this life. Speak to hearts, I pray, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together, please. Every head bowed. Every eye closed. The music's playing tonight. We want to come tonight. Maybe God is strengthening your faith. Maybe tonight you're going through a mess. You just want to come and ask God, thank you, God, for what you've brought me through. Give me strength to get me through what you have before me. God, strengthen my faith so I can strengthen others' faith. I know Moses was grateful for his parents' faith. If you've had people help strengthen your faith, come thank God for them. And then you commit that you're going to be a person of faith. It would have been easy for Moses to choose the pleasure of sin. It would have been easy for Moses halfway through those 40 years to give up. By the way, he argued with God every now and then about getting rid of the people. But he kept on going by faith. He kept on going by faith. And because of his faith, God allowed him to see the promised land. We know he... Uh, made bad choices and couldn't go into the promised land but God did take him home and by his faith Joshua raised up because of Moses faith 
Man, let's learn to have faith in God. By faith, it won't always make sense. If you can explain, I think Brother uh, David Gibbs Jr. said it this way, if you can explain it, it's not by faith. There's times, you've served God long enough, there's times in your life you're thinking, I have no idea how this happened, but God, but God. Thank Him for the faith He's strengthening in your life. Amen. We're going to be dismissed now. We're singing a song on the way out. But first, remember, I don't, I don't have to remind you of this because we're getting rid of two of them tomorrow. I mean, we got two kids going to camp tomorrow. Praise the Lord for that. Tomorrow at 11 o'clock, the bus will be here ready to go. Sack lunch, have all that stuff ready. And be praying. Even if, you're, even if it's not your young people that are going to camp, pray for the young people of our church that God would work. I'll let you know later on why I know that God has big plans for this week. It's the thing that Craig told me about. God is going to use this week in the lives of our young people if they want. Now, camp is kind of like church. You'll go and you'll get out of it what you went to get out of it. You'll have a good time. You'll get some mountain rains, hopefully. Thunder and lightning, things like that. You get to go to an actual real life old-fashioned rodeo and cowboy cookouts and skits and have a great time. You'll get to go and hear preaching and all that. Or you go up there and you know what? I want God to speak to my heart. And if God, if you do, God will. Let's pray that they would go up there and come home different. We've got some good kids in our church. I'm young people. I'm thankful for them. I love our young people. We don't, but as I heard one guy say years ago, I don't want just good kids. I want godly kids. Let's pray that this would be the start of a revival in our church sparked to the, the young people in our church. Okay, by faith, let's pray. Through our young people, most revivals have started through young people. Pray that it'll happen uh, this week. I don't know if it's number 19. 92. Touring that city. Number 92. We'll sing that on the way out tonight. Number 92. 92. We'll sing both verses on our way out. Many times I have about the signs of that sea and all that my eyes shall behold. I will see all the wonders when I enter that city, there forever to be shaped in this hold. Some morning you'll find me touring that city where the sun of God